Thanks very much for coming out tonight. My name is Tom Mickelson. I'm the president and scientific director of the Ontario Brain Institute, or OBI. So on behalf of organization, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge, as we always do, that the OBI uh, is located in Toronto, and the indigenous name for Toronto, meaning the place in the water where the trees are standing. We're on the traditional territories of the many indigenous nations in Canada, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and now uh, home to many diverse uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. So we're grateful for the opportunity to both live, work, and learn on this land, and we affirm our responsibility to engage in reconciliation. So as part of that commitment, we'll be looking uh, at ways to uh, uh, center the Indigenous perspective in our public talks and uh, seek opportunities to learn from Indigenous peoples in science and wisdom, uh, and we hope you will join us in that effort. So over the past 10 years, the OBI has uh, hosted more than 35 public talks. We feature experts in neuroscience and brain health. These conversations are intended to uh, educate, to inform, and empower you with knowledge about brain health, drawing from the latest advances in research and care. So the goal of the 2023-2024 series is called Brain Health Basics. It's to offer simple, insightful, and science-supported ways where you can support brain function in everyday life. So at today's Eat and Play for Brain Health event, uh, we hope to underscore what we know about the importance of sharing a meal, as well as look at creative, sustainable, and nourishing ways to feed our bodies and brain on a budget. So as a self-identifying uh, uh, home-based cook, and I've been doing that since I was a preteen and continue very much today, I'm always keen to learn about tricks of the trade, and as such, I look forward today to the insights of our speakers, uh, to what they have to say about nutrition and building community around sustenance, but also the notion of play, getting creative with food uh, preparation, also using mealtimes as an opportunity uh, where we can socialize and in engage in meaningful dialogue. But before we start the panel, I want to introduce you to a woman uh, in video remarks whose name is Susan Fitzpatrick from the Board of Directors of the Ontario Brain Institute. She was an inaugural member. She started uh, as an original board member 12 years ago. Uh, she originally, she's a bigwig. She received her PhD in biochemistry and neurology in Cornell uh, in the US. And after five years pursuing something called NMR, spectroscopic studies of brain metabolism, so hardcore science in the Department of Molecular Biochemistry at Yale, uh, she shift, shifted to the nonprofit sector where she managed an organization called the James S. McDonald Foundation and recently retired from that. She teaches uh, extensively uh, and, and gives seminars as a vol voluntary faculty member at the Washington University in St. Louis and at the Center for Biology and Society, the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State. So she has uh, many accomplishments, but she's a fellow of the Association for the Advancement of Science and for the Association of Women in Science. Uh, she's been very fortunate, we've been very fortunate to benefit from her expertise and the mentorship through much of our staff uh, as a board member from uh, the OBI. So thank you very much for, enjoying, uh, for joining us this way, Susan, and uh, cue the video. Good evening, and a warm welcome to each of you. Thank you for that introduction, Tom. As a neuroscientist, I have spent most of my science career studying the energy needs of the brain, and my philanthropic career advancing the idea that science is at its best when it serves societal needs. I have always believed that if you want to achieve something different, you must do something different. OBI's commitment to forging and nurturing a scientific approach that values collaboration over competition and that centers the needs of the patient and the community was and is something different. And the outcomes speak for themselves. In just over a dozen years, the team has successfully brought together experts from across the province's health spectrum, seamlessly connecting researchers, innovators, patients, and caregivers, positioning Ontario as a world leader in brain health. OBI's purpose is to accelerate brain health solutions. In practice, this means enhancing the quality of life for those impacted by brain disorders, whether they be our own challenges or those of our loved ones. At the same time, OBI is also pursuing the knowledge that will help each of us preserve and maintain neurological function 
across the lifespan. My personal dedication to this purpose is why it's a true privilege for me to provide opening remarks this evening. I only wish I could be there with you tonight as you delve into the importance of nourishing both mind and spirit. One would be hard pressed to find a community around the world that does not have a tradition of coming together around shared experiences and shared meals. It is my belief that such universalism reflects essentialism. Humans need these activities to thrive. The brain is a hungry organ relying on a steady supply of nourishment to function, but nourishment does not only mean glucose and oxygen. Reflecting back to the pandemic era lockdowns, we all know how much we missed activities that brought us together. Concerts, athletic events, visits to museums. We missed shaking hands, embracing, and seeing emotions play across our family and friends' faces. We missed gathering around tables. And even though many of our activities have resumed, the U.S. Surgeon General is launching a concerted effort to deal with what he has called the epidemic of loneliness. Stitch this to many other health concerns around obesity, sedentary lifestyles, poor nutrition, and you see how feeding our bodies and feeding our psyches is not a luxury. It is a basic and essential need. But there is a big difference between knowing and doing. Through this talk, I hope you will become motivated to learn more, to try different tools and strategies, and ultimately develop a better understanding of what and how you feed your body also nourishes your brain. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator. Please join me in welcoming Farah Kaiser. Farah is a genomics researcher by training who previously worked as the Director of Research and Policy at Evidence for Democracy. Outside the lab, she has written about science for various media outlets, served on the Canada Chief Science Advisors Inaugural Youth Council, and sits on the Let's Talk Science Board of Directors. As if that wasn't enough, Farah recently co-wrote her first children's book, Kaja and the Elephant Toothpaste Experiment, a story about a young girl carrying out an at-home science experiment with mixed and messy results. Please join me in. Thank you for the introduction, Susan, and I'm sorry we got you off right there. Um, but it's my pleasure tonight to welcome you to our event. As tonight's moderator, I'll be facilitating a 45 to 50 minute chat with our panelists, after which we'll be taking audience questions. Just a little bit of housekeeping. So if you're tuning in from the live stream uh, to send us your questions, please use the chat function, which is on the right side of your screen, or you can email us at communications at braininstitute.ca. And for those of us who are here in person, whenever you have a question, please raise your hand if you're able to do so. And members of the OBI team, so people who are gonna be waving uh, at the back and around, uh, they'll come and join you. They'll pass you a paper and pencil and you can write down your question, which we'll be collecting. And you can also email us at communications at brainstitute.ca. So you're welcome to participate whichever way you feel comfortable. And yeah, I'm gonna move on to introducing our superstar uh, lineup of panelists. So starting off, I'm gonna read out people's uh, biographies as they're walking up the stage. So I'm gonna start off with Guylaine Ferla, who is a professor of nutrition at Université de Montréal and a scientist at the Research Center of the Montreal Heart Institute. She's an expert in vitamin K metabolism and her team has made significant contributions to the role of this nutrient in brain function and cognition. She is also the leader of the Nutrition, Exercise, and Lifestyle team of the Canadian Consortium of, on Neurodegeneration and Aging, a nationwide research initiative on Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases in aging. And I was also Googling you, Gilan, before this, and I noticed that you've actually published over 200 papers and you've been cited 5,000 times, which is incredible. So a small round of applause, please. <laughs> 
Next, we have Shay London, who is the executive director at The Stop, which is an organization dedicated to increasing access to healthy food in Toronto. Shay has been associated with The Stop for 10 years. Her introduction to the team actually came as a volunteer, and soon after, she was employed in progressive roles in the organization, culminating as the first community services coordinator in 2016. The Stop plays an integral community role, offering support, fostering health and togetherness, and challenging inequality. And fun fact, because I'm going to have a few of these throughout the night, the Stop is actually one of Canada's first food banks. It's been around since 1980. And this is actually a full circle moment for Shay because she started off as a volunteer. She also served on the board for the Stop, and now she's currently the executive director. So, round of applause. <laughs> And last but not least, we have David Wolfman, who is a, ch a chef professor at George Brown College for the last 30 years, providing inspiration with his many professional achievements and playing a vital role in shaping the college's reconciliation efforts. Sorry there. Uh, dedicated to enhancing the quality of life for the Indigenous peoples, David also serves as a director of Indigenous initiatives at the college. And my fun fact for David is, uh, he actually served as a TV show host for APTN for almost a decade, which is really interesting. <laughs> Welcome, David. And I'm gonna grab a seat. So, turning our attention to the panelists, we're going to get the, start, the ball rolling with Yilen. So Gilan, there's a lot of information out there about nutrition from misinformation to fad diets to a new study in the news every day. So with the full knowledge that there's no magic bullet that we can use to sift through all of this knowledge, what is some baseline information that you can offer us today about nutrition for brain health? Well, uh, actually it's probably simpler than we think uh, in the sense that um, what is good for the body, what is good for the heart, uh, is also good for the brain. Uh, and uh, it makes sense uh, because, uh, um, you know, what, what will keep your cardiovascular system healthy, uh, um, you know, will help eventually nourish the cells of your brain. And uh, so when we look uh, at uh, the food patterns, and uh, uh, I invite you to, uh, uh, to, to go to the booth, we, uh, as part of uh, Team 5 C, uh, of CCNA, we have developed a Brain Health Food Guide. Perhaps you have, uh, you have it uh, with you, and I'll be happy to discuss how we developed it. But um, whether we're talking about the Mediterranean diet, whether we're talking about Canada's food guide, uh, you know, the notion of variety, the notion of having a diet that is rich in fruits and vegetables, um, various sources of, uh, of protein, whether the, they be plant-based or animal-based. Um, it's basically, um, and, and of course, I, I, we also acknowledge that uh, uh, sometime during the year that uh, fruits and vegetables are expensive, fresh ones, uh, but uh, we also uh, have to keep in mind that uh, frozen uh, fruits and vegetables have virtually the same nutritious value as um, uh, the frozen ones, as, as the, um, uh, the fresh ones. So there are ways to, uh, to eat, uh, to have a healthy diet on a, on a limited budget, if, if it is our reality. And, and uh, also, uh, of course, the importance of uh, uh, commensality, you know, the, the notion of eating with, with other people. Uh, and, and actually, there has been quite a bit of research um, pointing to the, um, uh, you know, the positive effects uh, with elderly people who have a small appetite, uh, all of a sudden when they're put in a family context or uh, if they're eating with friends, with neighbors, all of a sudden they, they have a better appetite. Uh, they eat more and, uh, um, and actually this has been investigated um, uh, in a systematic fashion. And um, you know we 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 know that uh, uh, this can be uh, definitely have positive uh, impact on on individuals. So um, you know there is the diet, of course, uh, which uh, and, and I'll be happy to discuss uh, the diet in more detail. But there's also the environment, and I think that uh, this is a very important component of it. Thank you for that, especially the tip on frozen food, because it's hard to get fresh produce throughout the year. 
And we're gonna dive into the whole idea of breaking bread, bread together a little bit more. My next question is actually going to go to David. So I know you also have a keen perspective on when it comes to seasonal uh, eating, you know, supporting local farms, fresh produce, but it's also important to use ingredients that one might have on hand. So can you please tell us more about that? Well, one of the things <clears throat> that um, um, I think about when I think about food is, is our connection. As an indigenous person and a proud member of Huckleup First Nation, is that it's a connection to food. So when we uh, look at food and, um, and the relationship to it, um, a, a perfect example is um, uh, back home where I'm from in the mountains, uh, there's a buttercup that comes out. And when that buttercup comes out, our whole community knows that, that the salmon are about to run. So when we see it, we all know it's just a, a matter of, of all going down to the river and getting our salmon. And we respect that, uh, that, um, uh, that uh, of the salmon. So when we take, even when we take the salmon, we take the innards out, we share them with our community. Everybody in the community has a job to do. Now, it's very limited resources if you look back to where um, uh, my mom is from. Uh, because when I said to her, you know, um, well, you guys had, you know, when, you know, when you were a kid, you guys had Oreo cookies, right? And she goes, no, we didn't, right? Like, we had very limited. I said, it must have been boring, them, the meals. But I would see my mom would take one or two items from the cupboard and, and manufacture. But going back to the relationship with the food, when we took the salmon, we took the innards out, or parts we didn't eat, we'd share it with the bears. So, uh, because the bears are part of our community, and you talked about environment. So, it, we look at it as a whole environment not just as ourselves. And then taking the, the salmon um, and even drying some of the salmon, so we'd bury some of it. We couldn't dry it at the same time we caught it because it was cool out, so we had to wait uh, for another, what I would call ecological indicator, which is like the buttercup is an ecological indicator, to tell us when to dry the salmon. Now, I know this is a longer story because Indigenous people always sat around and told stories. And I want to relate a little bit about what uh, you talked about, which is um, utilizing food uh, and, and being together. Uh, when I was going to George Brown College uh, in the 70s, um, I was two, by the way, <laughs> I, I, I was a rooming with a bunch of people. And I remember they said, well, aren't you a cook? And I thought, well, I wasn't. But I was training to be one. I said, yes, I am. right? And so I went into the cupboards and I remember I said, well, I bought some of this and I thought, are you guys hungry? They said, yes. And I went in the cupboard and I gathered a whole bunch of ingredients out of the cupboard. And you know, they had some noodles, some hot sauce, some of this, some of that. And I came up with this meal and just, you know, said, you know, it's just as a cook, you do that. What do I have and what can I prepare? And even later as a chef in a restaurant, that's what you do in your fridges because you want to utilize product and not waste it. So we all sat together, had the food, and they made a deal with me that they would pay my share of the rent if I cooked the food for them. And I thought, this is pretty good. And I didn't really know what I was doing. I thought, I wonder what that's going to taste like. But I experimented. And, and um, um, so that's one of the things that we, uh, I always find is that, how can I take these ingredients and put them together? My wife uh, is all about, where's your recipe? Right? It's like, I used to say, I don't need a recipe, but I don't say it anymore. I say, it's right there, right? And she would, I don't see broccoli in there. How come you're putting broccoli in? So I would um, uh, just um, um, make do. I mean, I think what's key, food is expensive. Uh, we can't be wasting food. And, um, and so I think it's just part of what we do as chefs as well. And uh, sharing uh, a space together, I think, is really key. I have an, uh, I know that you're going to, uh, we'll be talking about this later, but my father, who's 91, uh, and my mother-in-law, who's 98, lives with us. And when we feed them, usually I'm like, okay, go. As a chef, we, we don't chew food, right? We just, you know, we eat and just go, right? And my wife always says, you know, you can chew once in a while. But with our uh, elderly parents there, we spend the time, and, um, and if, I, if we rush them, they won't finish things. But uh, last night, I put a, a good amount of food, which I think was the right amount of food, for my mother-in-law. And I thought, okay, sounds like a time for another story. And my wife would go, oh boy. But then as we sat there and talked longer, I would see them eating all of the food. And I think that was really key. Well, I love that you were able to, you know, bypass rent by cooking. That's the deal. Uh, <laughs> that's the dream. As a college student, you know, that's... Uh. But what I think I'm hearing is sort of the food is important, but the environment that we're also eating in also matters. 
And with that, I'm gonna to go to Shane next, but before I do, I'm just gonna give a little bit of context for this question. So you might have noticed in the last year, the use of food banks has been increasing. There was actually a study by Food Banks Canada where they found that in 2023, there were 1.9 million Canadians who had to access, who had to use food banks, and that's increased by 32% since 2022. And a third of the clients were actually children. So sort of with that context, Shay, can you tell us more about the STOP and why organizations like the STOP are so important, especially today? Yeah, well, thank you for framing it as such. Um, you know, as someone who grew up on the margins myself, uh, being raised by a single mother in the city of Toronto, you know, she was an immigrant raising three girls in the city. I am intimately familiar with the pressures and challenges of financial struggles, being broke, being hungry. Um, and it's through my own lived experience that I will forever advocate for the STOP and organizations like the STOP doing work to um, provide programming and support that recognizes the whole person. Um, today, more than ever, you know, organizations like the STOP are critical in our communities. Uh, food is a basic human right, right? We all need it, we're all talking about it, that's why we're here. But uh, we, we understand that hunger cannot actually be addressed in isolation, right? Um, rather, there is a, an interconnected web of broken systemic structures that lead to conditions of poverty, um, insecurity, um, poor health, environmental degradation, and uh, very few social, social intimate uh, and meaningful social connections. Um, so our aim at the stop is to be a beacon of hope and uh, to provide that support. You know, we recognize that poverty is a state. It's a condition. It's not an identity. We never want uh, people who are experiencing poverty to feel shame. Um, so therefore, we try to meet people where they're at by offering a myriad of uh, entry points and gateways into the organization through different programs uh, and opportunities of engagement, such as our uh, Healthy Beginnings program, community kitchens, um, community gardens, our advocacy services, uh, et cetera. And uh, it's these programs that are designed to empower individuals to lead with, with agency. Um, as well as an organization, we also recognize our own responsibility of um, advocating for stronger social policies um, that recognize the challenges of our most marginalized and vulnerable communities, right? We want to ensure that everyone has a voice, um, it has, feels that they're seen, and has uh, a seat at the table. Um, that's one of the things that we advocate for, a seat at the table where these critical conversations are happening. So I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight and to, to talk about the organization that I, I represent, the STOP, and all sorts of organizations like ours. Um, because we're not just feeding, feeding the hungry, we're also nourishing the hopes and dreams of entire communities. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing more about the STOP, Shay. And I guess we've been circling around this, so now we're gonna to come to it. It's this phrase of breaking bread together. It's a phrase that's sort of been rolling around ever since we started talking about this panel. I mean, for me right now, it's Ramadan, so this whole idea of breaking our fast together is sort of something that comes from my community, but I also wanna know what it means for our, our panelists. So Guillen, what does the phrase breaking bread together mean to you? Um, well, it uh, I comes from a francophone, uh, family, as, as uh, you will have uh, noticed with my accent. And uh, of course, uh, uh, in Quebec, and uh, uh, family meals uh, were always important when, when, I was, uh, uh, when I was growing up. I mean, we typically, uh, we would be going to church on Sunday, Sunday mo uh, morning, and uh, uh, after that, we would have uh, you know, a, a large-scale uh, lunch, and uh, uh, Sunday was really a day of, of uh, where the children with the parents uh, we were, you know, we were uh, eating together, and um, it's um, it, it, it's 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 lifting. Uh, you know, it's not only are we eating, but it's a uh, it's the time when uh, when we communicate. When sometimes, uh, you know, my father used to work long hours. Uh, he was a mechanic, and and so uh, uh, he would come home late at night and. Um, 
So on Sunday were, was really the day where we could, uh, uh, we, we would uh, communicate and uh, tell the stories of the week. And, uh, um, and, and I was fortunate too to, to have, uh, to be very close to both my grandmothers who um, turned out to live up until the, the age of 97, in the case of my maternal grandmother, um, 19 children. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, Catholic background, I tell you, um, in Quebec, yeah, and, uh, and my paternal grandmother also at uh, the age of 88. So, uh, and you know, they, um, I, I recall that, uh, you know, uh, in addition to teaching me, introducing me to, uh, to uh, taking care of plants and, and uh, botanics, um, the, they also were sharing recipes and uh, ways to, to prepare the food, uh, which I, I still uh, use uh, today, many, many years later. So it's something that uh, uh, I think is, uh, and, and when we, uh, when, when we, um, whether uh, we start learning a new language, some, a few years ago I started learning Italian simply because I think it's so beautiful, but it, it's also the culture. Culture. It's also the first thing that uh, you know that they teach you after the grammar is basically the food, typical food uh, of the various regions. So it's so much part of our civilization, of our ethnicity, uh, that um, you know I I, um, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so much is happening as we're talking and we're eating food. It's it may be rent, it may be learning and socializing and uh, socializing as we eat or it's feeding entire communities. So I'm gonna go to Shay next. Shay, what does the notion of breaking bread together become a reality at the shop? Yes. Um, well, I love this question so much because uh, it is actually the fabric of what we do at the stop. I think if uh, one were to come into the organization and ask 50 different people, uh, this question, you might get 50 different answers because it actually serves each of us in different ways. But there are common themes and threads uh, of breaking bread, you know. At the stop, the notion of bread is, the notion of breaking bread together isn't just uh, a saying. It's actually a lived experience that unites all of us. Um, we understand the power of food to bring people together and to break down barriers. Um, breaking bread together goes beyond sharing a meal. It embodies our commitment to fostering you know, meaningful social connections and combating social isolation. Um, that's why uh, at the stop we create spaces where individuals can come together to not just eat together, but, uh, but to learn about food, to grow food, to advocate for healthy food, but also of course to prepare, share and enjoy meals together. Um, we believe that participation helps to overcome stigma. And when individuals come together, when individuals come through our doors, they are met with this entirely vibrant community of care, you know, and it's something that like I'm so proud of. Um, breaking bread together isn't just about nourishing our bodies, it's about nourishing our souls. Uh, it's about respecting each other and allowing everyone to have a voice. Um, and we celebrate that uh, spirit of togetherness um, that flourishes at the stop where breaking bread together isn't a concept, it's actually a reality that like brings us closer and as an organization I feel it truly makes us stronger and I see there's uh, friends of the stop here in the front row so that's nice. Um, but yeah. So. Uh, what you just said about it's food is about nourishing our soul, I think that's a really important takeaway that's at least going to stick with me for the rest of the night. Uh, so for you, David, in your work as a chef and now as a chef professor, uh, what can you tell us about the connection between the brain and how we feed our bodies? Well, there's, <clears throat> um, I've seen, um, um, or I've witnessed people completely changing, and one of them is my father, as I talked about earlier. <clears throat> my father is now turning 92 this year, and when he moved in with me, which was just over um, uh, about 18 months ago, he was uh, malnourished. He had lived alone and he had, he had people taking care of him, but I, I remember doubting that a couple of times and then I came over a few times and thought, uh, he needs to move in with me. And that was a big uh, change for him, change for me, right? Having your father come back home. Um, and just so you know, I'm not rent free anymore. I just thought I'd <laughs> bring that up again. Wish I was, but anyway. Um, 
And, uh, I, and I saw my father change. Like when he first came, he would sit there and just eat. And even my wife used to say, what's wrong with your dad? And I just say, e-, you know, like, we don't say that about her mom. Like, she wouldn't say it in front of him. But I'd say, you know, he's, he, you know, he's just getting used to uh, being in, in our house. And, um, and hardly any conversation where we would always be talking. And so my dad was kind of the new one to the house. And um, now it's, it's really interesting that seeing him progress and eating all of these foods. And I remember saying to him, this food is really good for your brain. I don't want it, he'd say. Right? <laughs> say, well, I'm going to have something. And then Marge, who's 98, she'd say, well, I want some, right? And whatever, you know, it's just like spinach or something green. And, and my dad would you know, only eat green peas, that's it, right? So, so um, anyway, it's, it's interesting seeing the, the progression of him now who, who um, if he doesn't have a book to read, there's, there's this is, how come I don't have more books? Uh, which is great. So at first I said to him, do you want to read a book? And he wouldn't um, be reading. And his doctor diagnosed him with dementia and Parkinson's. And um, they, one of the medications they gave, they said, it's, chances are this works to 30 to 40% of the population. And he was sitting there and he goes, oh, I like those numbers. Because my dad's a numbers person. And, um, and he was one of the lucky people that it really worked well. And he continuously reads. And, and now he's like, give me some of that asparagus. Does it taste OK? <laughs> it's like, yeah, he'll eat it. It's like, it doesn't taste good, but I know it's good for me. So he's now relating, uh, which he had, in my opinion, I, did, I didn't see. He, he wasn't connecting it to. Right? And I think that food is really key. It's important to, uh, like you said, it's not, it just, it, it's, for me as a chef, it's got to taste good. It's got to look good. And I remember um, uh, when I was uh, running a catering company, I had this fantastic chef. And people would compliment him. Your food looks great. And he used to say, you know, it tastes good, too. And he always get offended. I said, Brian, say thank you, and then <laughs> let them taste it, then they'll tell you. Um, so it, in my opinion, food needs to look good. It's got to smell good, taste good. It's got to sound good. In other words, how we express our food. Uh, but it's also that, uh, that part of sharing and sitting together. Uh, we have a rule, no phones at the table. Of course, my 90-year-old mother-in-law says, go get your phone. I want to know about this. <laughs> something in the 1930s, or you know what I mean? It's like, and at first she used to say, how do you get all that stuff in that phone? How do you get those videos in there, right? You know, at first. So now she's, once in a while, she'll ask at the table, can you look at this? I said, why don't we wait till after the meal, right? Because it's, it's, it's interesting. But so I think there's a really uh, huge connection with, and it's not, and it's part of it is the food, but I think it's part of it is the dialogue, the, the laughing together. The, the joking and, and the sitting there and taking, taking an hour for dinner, you know, and it's so nice. As a chef who grew up in the industry, you know, you feed everybody, feed everybody, feed everybody, and then two of us will go in the corner and just, okay, good, you know, and everything for me when I remember in the 90s, everything was, okay, I got a bun, you grab a bun or a Kaiser, whatever you were cooking went in that bun and you ate it because that was the time that you had. So you looked after everybody else's food and being young was fine, I could do that, so. But now it's, I'm at a nice place in my life where we can actually share and, and like you said, breaking bread together. I think it's, that's so important. Uh, and we laugh. It's almost like we don't want to leave the table now, too, which is neat. That's beautiful. But also now, so food has to look good, has to sound good, and has to taste good. <laughs> Setting high expectations. Uh, so we're going to be moving to audience questions in about 10 minutes. So this is just a reminder. Feel free to keep sharing your questions. You can raise your hand if you want to submit them. And you can also submit them through communications at braininstitute.ca. Uh, I'm going to turn back to Guillen. So it's, we've talked about this idea of breaking bread, but it's also about specifically the foods that we use to nourish our brains. So you spoke earlier about frozen vegetables. What else can you share with us with tips about nourishing our brain with food? Yeah. Well, um, if, if uh, we go back to uh, the Brain Health Food Guide that we, uh, that we developed, uh, at the time we developed it uh, around 2015. And uh, at the time there, uh, there were, uh, I mean, it was the year also that was published, the first intervention study with the uh, Mediterranean diet um, uh, to investigate cognition per se, memory, um, uh, thinking speed, these kinds of things. And um, actually, it, because the Mediterranean diet had been investigated m m for many years with respect to cardiovascular disease, cancer, 
But um, so we thought uh, that this was a good starting point. Uh, that the Mediterranean diet, the way the way uh, it balances, it, you know, uh, food. It does not exclude any food, but um, you know the way it. it um, uh, prioritize some of the foods. Uh, when you look at the base of the pyramid, you have grains, whole grains, and then you have fruits, vegetables, and, and, and so on. So we started with that, but we also took into consideration the most recent uh, research. I mean, it, it, it was, we were all researchers, and so we knew, for instance, that um, uh, berries, uh, the polyphenols that are uh, contained in, in berries and, and uh, um, you know, and, and First Nations have known this for many, many years, by the way, uh, but uh, whether it's, um, you know, strawberries, raspberries, um, it, they're extremely rich in terms of, uh, uh, um, with respect to, to these polyphenols, which have you know, uh, are, um, uh, have potential to limit inflammation and, and whatnot. There was also um, uh, some evidence, com growing evidence around uh, green leafy vegetables, which are uh, the main source of, uh, the, the, mo the richest source of vitamin K, but it also contains other homocysteine and, you know, um, um, so, uh, you know, um, it was. It was also. Uh, we, we, uh, there was evidence to suggest that we could specifically um, uh, include a green leafy vegetables and the cruciferous vegetables too. Uh, the uh, broccoli, uh, all the cabbages. Uh, they're extremely uh, good uh, for um, you know uh, very dense in terms of uh, um, of nutrition. And uh, uh, there was also quite a bit of work that had been done around nuts, uh, and especially walnuts, uh, um, in, in, due to its um, fatty acid profile. You know, it, it has omega-3 fatty acids. So um, we, um, and, and when we look at the guide, it is largely um, inspired by the Mediterranean diet when you, when you look at what is being proposed. But we have some, some specifics. Uh, in terms, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, that we think uh, are um, uh, more particularly pertinent for the brain health. And uh, so, you know, all this is, is uh, detailed in, uh, uh, in our guide, which is a simple one, a two-pager. We wanted this uh, to be simple. Um, but um, basically, uh, you know, uh, those would be the, the specifics uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the guide, but it is largely based uh, on, on uh, uh, a merger of the Mediterranean diet and of the DASH diet, which was also, uh, which had been developed prior and uh, in order to, uh, uh, to, to fight against hypertension. So um, it's basically in, inspired by these two diets with uh, the most recent uh, research on, on some specific uh, categories of, uh, of food. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Gwen. And so for people who are starting a shopping list, we've got leafy green vegetables, we've got berries and walnuts on the list. <laughs> Uh, for you, David, in your work, you've helped to boost people's confidence around food availability and menu planning, such as creating menus around basic pantry ingredients that they may have readily available or food items that can be stretched like a whole chicken. So we'd love to hear more of your tips on this. Yeah, uh, I um, did a little program where I was teaching people how to cook basic fundamentals. And uh, some of the people that uh, were my clients, they said, well, we want something that's really fun, um, um, looks nice, and um, uh, something that's really economical. And it was like, oh wow! Like I was just going to use all these fancy garnishes in, in my head, right? So you know, I was going to, and so I thought, wow, okay. And so I came up with this plan of buying groceries, and it was um, probably something similar to what you do. So I brought in like three bags of groceries, and it was like a, a whole chicken, some. Um, uh, some celery, onions, carrots, the usual stuff. And I brought all these things and I left the bill in the bag on purpose. And so when they were taking all the food out and I was teaching everybody, so I said, okay, so I'm gonna show you what to do. And we took it out and they said, well, here's the bill. And I said, why don't you keep the bill? And just, how much did I spend? And, and this was a number of years ago. So it was surprisingly $42. 
which probably would be 142 today, uh, or not, maybe not, but. Uh, and um, so what I did is I took the chicken and I, I, I said, here's some, some basic knife skills, take the legs off, take the breasts off, here's the wings, uh, here's the bones, let's put them in a pot, let's make a, uh, get it cooking as a stock. And with the leg, I'm gonna take the bone out of the leg and so I'm gonna flatten it out and I seasoned them all up. And I ended up making uh, seven different dishes out of this. And people didn't really realize what I was doing. So I took one chicken breast and cut it into, you know, flattened it out and dusted it with a little bit of uh, breadcrumbs and some eggs. And, and so I made that and, and I just I kept making all of these dishes and I put them all out there. And then I said, oh, how much was that again? And they said it was $42. And I said, well, plus we have this soup, a bowl of soup there. I had some little um, rice noodles that I put into it. And, and I also showed some varieties of, this was gluten-free, right? Uh, this one was, uh, uh, heart smart. Yeah. This one wasn't. This one was deep, deep fried in oil, right? So I said, you know, we got a little bit of everything here. But just in doing that, that uh, people were saying, wow, I can't believe that you made all of those dishes out of that. And most of them, I would say, you know, can you give me a hand? Can you give me a hand? So it was really not myself doing it as a chef and a chef uh, instructor, uh, but it was them creating it as well. And they said, so you can do this at home. I said, absolutely. And one of the biggest, biggest questions I get asked is, can, what can I, what spices? I need to know the secret spices. And it's like, okay, I take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Where did you learn that? And I thought, well, you know, you know, first of all, I would look at my cupboard and say, well, I only have rosemary. So I remember I had a, a, a friend that used to come over and visit me. Said, well, you, rosemary goes with a lot of different things. I said, well, that's all I have in my cupboard, right? So therefore, that's what we're going to use. But, so it wasn't as, as, you know, as, as people see, it's a little bit more about being creative and, and not being afraid to try things. Obviously, some things don't match. Right? But uh, you know, having some common sense and some uh, basic, basic um, uh, knowledge of it helps too. Right? So I think that giving people the confidence that, wow, it, even it's that easy to do it. Uh, and, and the answer is really yes. And, and, and for people that do work with uh, meat, if, they, if you have a chicken, um, you can realize that boneless chicken breasts are so expensive now, where if you take a whole chicken, all of a sudden you have these byproducts, which make other dishes, is, is fantastic. And then, you know, it's also uh, using different products um, um, when we, even, even uh, the peeling of new potatoes, you know. Um, uh, I, I was showing people that if you actually use a, a paring knife to do this, now we can take those uh, potato peelings and make something out of it. Because again, uh, the nu nutrients next to the skin is, is where a lot of that is. And, you know, we, I even remember showing somebody, we had some uh, uh, carrots and some purple carrots, and I was using a peeler, and they're going, whoa, you're peeling that too much. And what I did is I dusted them with um, uh, some corn flour uh, and then deep fried them and used them as a garnish on top. Because I was, you know, I was doing more than just peeling them, right? So, but again, trying to utilize everything. Wasting food is something that I'm really uh, against. You know, I have a rule at the table, well, except for, my father and my mother-in-law, I might be a little bit of a bend to it because I want them to eat. Because they'll say, just give me a little, and then they'll say they're full. So we do want to make sure they, they get their nutrients. So with the exception of that, um, I always have a rule. Uh, in my kitchen and every restaurant I've worked in, if you wanted to have a steak, uh, or you know, there might be some things that are off limit in the menu, but take what you want, eat what you take. Uh, and you want more? Uh, come back and have more. So just take a little bit. And, and it's something that I think that is really great because I can't stand uh, throwing food out, you know, and uh, it, it's just a crime almost to, to that. So. Mm -hmm. so avoiding food waste and also sometimes you just work with what you have and sometimes it's rosemary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, by the way, I have a lot of spices in my car. Too many of you ask my wife, right? So now, right? But I'm fortunate for that. Uh, I'm going to turn to Shay for our last question before audience questions. So Shay, how does the STOP, which originated as a food assistance organization, take the mental well-being of clients to a different level? Thank you. Um, yeah, we have evolved from a food assistance organization to a more holistic uh, support system, um, prioritizing not just the physical hung hunger, but also the mental well-being of our members and our, of our community members, um, recognizing the link between uh, social isolation and poverty, um, we understand that social connectedness is fundamental to mental health. Um, the prevalence of mental health concerns has been starkly on the rise, especially since uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, as I think we're all aware. And the ways in which we both work and socialize have only tended to further distance us from one another and, and from our communities. 
um, exacerbating feelings of isolation. So that only serves to underscore the importance of social connectivity. Um, and we recognize that in, in our work. Um, there may be people here familiar with the academic uh, Kim Samuel. Uh, she has, she's the founder of the Samuel Center for Social Connect Connectedness and had, has written a book called On Belonging, Finding Connection in an Age of Social Isolation. And uh, in that book, Samuel um, identifies the four dimensions of belonging. And uh, they are a connection to um, people, connection to place, connection to um, power, and a connection to purpose. And uh, at the stop, we try to find that through line of all four of those dimensions um, by way of shared experience um, and engagement within the organization um, through our community-focused initiatives, again, through like our volunteering experiences. Uh, we've got hundreds of opportunities for people to, to volunteer. Community kitchens, community gardens, um, and even our drop-in meal service, right? Um, we build community using food as that tool. Food is the tool that brings people into the door. It's the, the tool that brings people together. And through that, it helps to break the cycle of isolation and, uh, and, and, the, and the stigma of poverty, quite frankly. Um, we believe that this holistic approach is uh, the thing that helps us to create a more resilient and, and stronger community. Thank you for that. And I think the first audience question we're going to start off with is connected to that. So we have a question from the audience member who's noting that it's all well and good when people have someone to break bread with. But what about the millions of people, seniors and others who live alone? So we've heard specifically about the stop and the services they offer. But for all of our panelists, what are some organizations or strategies that people can turn to to boost social connection? And maybe I'll start off with David. Well, during, um, during COVID, um, we were trying to partner up with other people in our family who had nobody else with them and set up an iPhone or an iPad and have dinner with them, right? To, you know, and I've, I found that was a really neat way uh, to share a recipe because I said, well, I've got a recipe you should try. Of course, a lot of my recipes were complicated, so I thought, I've got to find some simple recipes if I want people to, uh, to, to do that. And, and I think that it's... Knowing that there's somebody out there, knowing that there's somebody that's going to share with you, um, that's going to um, talk. Uh, what most of our, um, our engagements ended up being is that people didn't want to sit there at, at dinner. They actually, why don't I call you after dinner? And then we talked longer, right? So it was not, because I think some people were just uncomfortable with what they were eating. And so I think that the, the key is the, is the connection and knowing that, um, that somebody's out there to help them. So, uh, and I think that during COVID, it really um, um, taught us to, to realize that there's a lot of people out there, especially during the time, that were sitting at home alone. And so it was definitely challenging, especially within our community, our remote communities, where when you're looking at some of the First Nations and some of my cousins back home, where, you know, the, where they are, they're, you know, a mile or two miles away from the next house. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Shay, sort of building off what you had just said about this idea of connectedness, uh, what happens when people access the stop? How do they build that sense of community? And what about people who don't have something like a stop in their community? How can they build community and have someone to break bread with? So, what was the first part of the question? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I just gave a lot there. So if someone heads to the stop, how do they start building that community to break bread together? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, and we don't put that onus of responsibility of the person entering the doors, right? Uh, that's kind of built into our culture and, and the values that we espouse. So for us, it is about recognizing people, acknowledging people as they come through the door. Um, I mean, the first, the way of building relationships is acknowledging people's existence, um, getting to know people by name. Um, and, and so many people will come in and they actually don't want to be seen because of the stigma of perhaps finding themselves in a place like our organization where they perhaps never thought they would uh, be in a position to, to do so. But again, it's through 
those genuine relationships that are being built um, and developed uh, at the pace that the individual, you know, kind of dictates through their responses, that um, people oftentimes find a place for themselves inside of the organization. And what about you, Kian? Do you have research or experience or expertise that you can offer in how people can boost social connection and socializing around food? This is not really my, uh, my field of expertise. I'm, I'm more uh, 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 clinical and basic science. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, we have to have at all levels, but um, um, you know, uh, certainly um, uh, th there are uh, very, very good uh, Canadian researchers uh, that uh, are uh, um, looking at these aspects. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, my colleague uh, Heather Keller. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I think the, the connection, I mean, from what I, uh, you know, uh, from what I get from listening to their conference, their talks, um, you know, the, the, the connection is, is oftentimes, um, you know, the, the, le nerf de la guerre, as we say, you know, it, it's, uh, it's really the, the key point and, and, uh, um, of course, if, if people are uh, now with, you know, the, the new generation of, of older individuals who are more savvy with, uh, with the internet and with, uh, you know, there's more ways to communicate uh, than, than um, let's say, 20, 25 years ago. Um, so now, you know, I, I remember during the pandemic, indeed, um, my, uh, my mother-in-law lives in Vancouver. And um, basically, she lives on her own. And, uh, you know, we would organize to have tea with her, you know, uh, in the afternoon. And uh, we, it would be via Zoom. And, uh, you know, that, that was one way we simply, well, th there's the distance too, but, uh, you know, the, even for people uh, within Montreal where I live, you know, we would have, uh, we would meet via, via this mode. But, of course, it's not necessarily, and, and I'm fully aware of the fact that it's not uh, everyone who is at ease with uh, these uh, modes of communication. And, um, yeah, but, you know, I, I think uh, uh, people, when people deliver the, the meals, I don't know exactly, you are more, especially Shia, you're definitely uh, more, more uh, uh, I mean, you know more about this than I, but uh, I know that at some point uh, there was a research project where the, 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 uh, the people who were from delivering the meals would systematically take time to chat with the individual, you know, with the person. Not only uh, provide the bag with the food, but you know, there was a, a time where there would be a conversation. And and so, uh, you know, this this is for people who are very isolated. Uh, they're they're looking forward to this one time during the week when. They will have a conversation with, uh, you know, with a, a young woman or a young man who is delivering the food. Um, but uh, there are definitely, um, you know, this is a field that, that I'm not, uh, uh, in which I do not work, but there's excellent research being done in Canada uh, on, on this very topic, yes. So I think this goes back to one of our opening remarks, which pointed out that loneliness is an epidemic, but we're hearing different ideas of, you know, Zoom tea time or, looking for people who are also searching for connection or going to organizations who create that culture where connection is really encouraged. Uh, I'll move on to our next question, which I think Yen does have the expertise for, which is, are there any supplements that are proven to help memory and cognition? Nice. No. <laughs> no. Don't say you forget. <laughs> um, uh, there are many uh, out there, and... Um, it's just, uh, you know, when we look at the quality of the, um, of the studies, there are CTs, I mean, they're, ideally, they're, they're randomized control trials uh, with control group, and um, uh, it's, um, the evidence is really not convincing. Um, I mean, there could, there could be reasons for that. Either, you know, the population chosen was not 
exactly the right one or the individuals were not uh, necessarily uh, taking at the right time you know because if we're think if we're talking about cognitive decline or alzheimer's disease we now know that as uh, the pathology underlying uh, alzheimer's disease developed 25 years to 30 years before the appearance of the clinical signs i mean this is really um, a, a, uh, an illness that begins, I mean, much more, much earlier in our lives than we think. And, and uh, I think that one of the problem with, with uh, the, the studies that have been conducted with, with supplements is oftentimes, uh, you know, they were given to people who were already in an advanced stage in, in the pathology, perhaps not clinically speaking, but certainly in the pathology. And um, uh, you know, th there's not been really um, uh, anything that, um, you know, when, you, when we look at uh, the, the, the results, uh, you know, results are often time uh, very, very, very limited and when they're very positive, uh, they, they, they were done with uh, uh, studies with a uh, small sample size. Um, there's also the question of how long, you know, how long you, the, the, the intervention period that you, you consider when, uh, when uh, you conduct these studies. But at the moment, uh, I'd rather prefer to see people spend their money on nutritious foods. Um, you know, uh, and, and uh, uh, salmon or, you know, the more expensive ones, let's say, uh, than, uh, than invest in, in supplements. Because, uh, to be honest, uh, uh, it's, um, it, it's not convincing. Because uh, had it been, we would have, uh, you know, we definitely would have uh, um, made this much more public. And uh, so when we look at the, 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 the whole of the literature, uh, it's not particularly convincing. Well, I guess you've all heard it. There's no supplement yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> I'm going to turn to you next, David. So can you recommend any traditional food, growing, sourcing, or preparation practices for people living in the city, especially people in apartments? Oh, wow. <clears throat> um, growing? Uh, okay, so uh, I think um, having uh, herbs in your window is really fantastic. You know, you can grow them year-round. Um, I've had more success doing that than I have in my, 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 my backyard. Uh, I've seemed to have more success. Um, and I always kind of laugh, say it's time for haircut, and then they keep appearing. But I, I want to say that one of our traditional foods where I'm from um, is called tawan, which is dried salmon. And uh, in order to make it, um, again, the way I was talking about it earlier, we buried our salmon, and then later on, when it was hot enough, uh, a grasshopper would uh, make this clicking sound with its uh, wings to cool down. And that clicking sound was the same sound that the knife would do, go along the back of the salmon. So we related that as it's time to go down and take our salmon out and dry it. Um, and uh, having some of this dried salmon the very first time, as an urban indigenous person going back home, there was a date on it, it said two, I don't know, it said, uh, well, okay, so this was 1983. So I think it was like two years before and somebody went, I have this salmon for you, it's two years old. I'm going, great, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and they said, well, yeah, we've been saving this. Um, you know, the newer salmon, we just give it to everybody else, but this is special for you. And I thought, so older salmon is, and I was reluctant to eat it. I'm thinking, this is fish, it's two years old. But uh, apparently they, they, dry, uh, they dry it with the wind. Uh, uh, and um, anyway, uh, so moving forward, my mom, who had left home in the 50s, never went back home. So I remember learning how to do it in a dehydrator. So I took the salmon, and, and I found a brine that I can uh, put it some salt, uh, just some basic salt and water, brine it, and then dry it with a fan and then put it in, um, in the, in the um, dehydrator. And it made, if, for those of you that like jerky or beef jerky or pemmican, I've also done that, but this is one that we could we take a traditional food and dry the salmon, which actually has a long shelf life. Uh, I remember asking one of the elders back home, are you sure this is fine? And they said, well, this, you know, we, uh, before ref refrigeration, we ate this regularly. And again, I was reluctant because I didn't know, you know, I was so accustomed to shelf lives of food and that. 
And, um, and so that's one of the things that we can do. The other thing that we do back home is we actually canned salmon in mason jars. And just uh, two days ago, I, I made the, um, um, I took some salmon out and just with some simple salt and pepper uh, and an, an egg, uh, pureed it up and made some patties and then just dusted it with a light uh, rice flour and pan fried it. And uh, it was so tender. And I have to think of textures as well especially when you have two people that don't have teeth. Um, but all of us, we, we really enjoyed it. It was a lot of flavor in it. But that canned salmon was from um, uh, when I took the lids off and I, and I made it. My dad came in the kitchen. He's like, look at all these dishes. And I always offer, if you want to do the dishes, but he doesn't, right? And he goes, 2021, the salmon is from 2021. It sure tasted good, right? But that's, uh, again, that's something that we do. We, we uh, do it properly. And these days now we have pressurized cans, uh, canning for meats, so it brings it up to the right temperature. So, so I think that's something that anybody can do. And, and um, I don't know if anybody cans or pickles, but you know it's, it's something in your cupboard that you have there and you can always pull out. But a lot of people don't think of meat or fish or, or that type of thing. Can we have a show of hands for people who can or pickle? Okay, we've got a few. I'm gonna go to Shay next. So, can you share any observations about what you've observed at the stop in terms of the link between food and shared experience and mental health? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in its most simplest terms, you know, we we um, it, interestingly enough, like in our drop-in program, you know, oftentimes we'll experience a bit more of a heightened sense of tension, let's just say, on a Monday because oftentimes people haven't eaten or eaten very well over the weekend. So we always know, like, you know, let's, uh, when, when things get a little tense on Mondays, let's just give people grace because it's breakfast and things will tend to calm down after that fact. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, we just make that connection between food and mental health through social connections. And again, you know, oftentimes we just use food as the tool that brings people in. But our work is not just about uh, giving people food because that's not the solution to hunger and we recognize that, right? Um, what we do is use food as an opportunity to engage people uh, with the broader food system, with the social structures and the political structures that create, you know, uh, the conditions for which many people are living. Um, you know, it's not just food that we're advocating for. We're also advocating for better, better and more affordable housing, um, childcare. It's all of those things that uh, those who are on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum um, are experienced the most challenge with. And so, again, we're just using food as that gateway, as that tool, as an entry point for people to engage with us in whatever way that they feel comfortable. Um, keeping in mind, you know, it's that exchange that happens over food and that allows for a broader opportunity for us to sort of figure out where and how we can provide a more fulsome support. Um, it's not the hand out, it's the hand up, if you will. <laughs> um, yeah. You've mentioned uh, providing grace for folks on Mondays because they may have spent a weekend waiting for their next meal. Have you noticed sort of any relations around holiday periods or long weekends? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, very much similar, similar in that regard. You know, um, one of the big. Uh, <laughs> And so, of course, so many of these holidays fall on Mondays. Um, so, you know, now we're extending that period of, of, of hunger um, beyond, you know, just the Saturday, Sunday period. It's into the Monday period. And, uh, and so, yeah, we take these holiday closures very, very seriously. Um, you know, and in that manner, you know, if there's anything left over, again, going to David's comment about food waste, food does not get wasted at the stop ever. Um, if ever there are things left over from a drop-in meal, um, those, those food items get packaged up and given out to the communities uh, for, for takeaways over the weekends. Um, and that happens not just on Fridays, it happens anytime there's, there's excess food. Um, but yeah, we definitely uh, see that connection between food, mental health, 
community and, and draw that through line again through all of our activities. I'm going to uh, shift over to diet. So we've actually had two questions about this, Guillen. Uh, you mentioned the Mediterranean and the DASH diet. Can you tell us more, what does the Mediterranean diet involve and what does the DASH diet involve? The Mediterranean diet uh, was, as its name refers to, was developed uh, um, in, uh, around the Mediterranean and it really started uh, to be investigated in, um, with people in Crete, uh, this island uh, in, in Greece. Um, and, and essentially, um, it's a diet that um, uh, is based um, in, uh, on, on um, you know, it, it's a, if you look at the pyramid, um, you know, at the bottom of the pyramid where, you know, where you have more portions, uh, uh, you have the, the grains and, uh, you know, there is an emphasis on whole grain. Uh, fruits and vegetables. I mean, there's no specificity around around that, but you know, they they should be plentiful. Uh, you know, in our in our meals uh, at at all time uh, of the day, uh, it includes dairy uh, also. Uh, there's no absolutely no no restriction around dairy or um, kefi or yeah yogurt. Uh, or milk, you know, it's all and cheese. It's all it's all there. Of course, in in moderation. It's not at the bottom. It's um, um, and and we now know that uh, you know uh, fermented food uh, um, like yogurt or kefir are extremely good for the gut. Uh, you know, and and this is probably going to be our next step. Uh, the next iteration of our of our guide is going to include more specific uh, foods uh, that are good for the gut, uh, and then you know uh, there is as we go up the the pyramid, um, we have um, you know we have fish of course uh, around the Mediterranean it, it's uh, it, it's easy, uh, but some meat, a limited amount of red meat but it's not excluded. And uh, there is uh, also the glass of wine, uh, of red wine. Now, um, so this is for the Mediterranean diet. Um, for the DASH diet, it was developed really in, in the United States. Uh, uh, and actually, I, I, it's, it's only recently that I realized that it had been developed many, many years, I mean, quite a few years ago. And, and this was really, um, actually it goes back to the 1990s, I believe, and, and this was really to try and help, um, you know, in, in light of the rise of uh, the prevalence of hypertension in the American uh, population. And so this was uh, developed uh, to try and help individuals to um, tackle their, their hypertension. Um, I mean, there are definitely common common uh, elements um, with respect to uh, fruits and vegetables, plenty of fruits and vegetables, uh, balanced diet, but the specificity really of the DASH diet is to try and limit uh, salt intake, I mean, sodium intake. Uh, so try and choose uh, the, the lower salt because you know, and even today, uh, we we eat um, more more sodium, more salt uh, than than we should, and um, of course, uh, um, a great source of uh, of salt uh, is uh, the um, uh, is found in the ultra processed foods. And um, when when these two diets were developed, uh, it was not um, mentioned, you know, because. Uh, uh, in those days, the ultra-processed food were were not so um, so popular. I mean, now when we look at uh, Canadian uh, uh, the the surveys in Canada, I mean, close to 50% of the calories come from ultra-processed foods. So um, you know, 20, 25 years ago, it was probably less less the case. So um, in uh, in. In the guide that we developed, uh, uh, if you look on the right side of page two, um, we have the foods that uh, should be limited. I mean, we, we are not excluding any food. I, personally, I, uh, you know, I don't think there's any such thing as a bad food. It's always a question of quantity, a question of, of uh, frequency of intake. And uh, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with crisps and, and chips and all these things. You know, but it, it's a matter of not eating those things every day, and, and uh, you know, 
in large quantities. So um, we we put um, some you know some warning uh, uh, towards ultra processed foods, uh, which we, we we know are high in salt and sugar, oftentimes too. So uh, this, uh, I would say, distinguishes. Um, and, and in our guide, even though it's very much inspired by Mediterranean diet, we did not, um, uh, we, we did not think it was wise to recommend uh, uh, alcohol intake. Um, you know, if people drink, uh, and, and we really went with um, current recommendations, you know, that if people uh, uh, drink well, try and, and you know, for men, limit this to 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 uh, consommation uh, per day uh, for uh, one, two drinks for men, one for for women, and if people don't drink, don't stop drinking. You know, I mean, if you want the the resveratrol, you just buy uh, grapes, and you will get uh, the polyphenol that you will want. It will be there. So, uh, you know, you don't need to stop drinking wine um, if uh, simply to get the resveratrol, you know, you can get it elsewhere. So, um, we did not think it, it was wise to uh, recommend uh, uh, drinking, yeah. So, sort of going off that same trend of being specific about the food, we're getting a few questions that are actually asking for recommendations. So, I'm going to start off with David. So, for families that have to ch that choose to be careful when purchasing groceries, what foods would you recommend purchasing on every monthly run? So what are your pantry staples that you would recommend? Um, well, I think there's, uh, when we look at the pantry, I think of brown rice, you know, I think of beans, um, dried beans, you know, uh, dried black beans is something I really like um, to make. It's very economical, it's, it's healthy for you. Uh, I, uh, as a chef, it's very simple. You just soak them overnight. Uh, and you can make, um, uh, I make a lot of different types of chilies, in, including vegetarian chilies, where I'll use some, uh, possibly some mushrooms and stuff like that. But I think we need to have the basics uh, in our fridge uh, ex as well, things like garlic, onions. Uh, if you can eat, uh, some people can't. Um, but I think some, um, uh, lots of different herbs, more than just rosemary. <laughs> and uh, to add some different flavors, and um, I, I like to also have uh, really good quality oils and vinegars. You know, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna buy it, uh, then you buy uh, something that's really decent quality, and then you can uh, have that. Like with olive oil, I love just having uh, olive oil on. Uh, if I have a roasted corn, I'll take it off the, uh, put it in um, in a bowl, and just some salt, um, pepper, uh, and a little bit of olive oil is a, for a change. It's it's nice. So I think having uh, the, uh, some um, good quality grains, I think, are really important too. And there's a lot of different things out there, from amaranth to quinoa um, to um, um, different types of rices to, uh, to try out. Uh, and they're really simple to prepare. When we think of all of the processed foods, it, it's so funny when people uh, ask me about, you know, did you make this rice from, from scratch? <laughs> it's like, okay. Uh, yeah, I did. I think I did. <laughs> um, so, um, and then, uh, you know, um, I've also um, been uh, experimenting over the last few years of making dried pastas. It's something that's really neat uh, that you can do very easily. Um, you know, with uh, I make it with beets, uh, um, um, squash, uh, and then you make the pasta and dry it out. I actually worked in a restaurant t uh, for a short period of time, working for somebody who didn't speak English who taught me how to make pasta. And she kind of reminded me of my mom because she always had a dish rag. And if I did something wrong, it was just a little slap to the hand, right? And I was like, okay, here it comes. I made another mistake. But I learned a lot about drying pasta. And I thought, wait a minute, you have eggs in here. You can't just leave these pastas sitting out overnight. And it was like, the, okay, we've been doing this for years, right? So again, it was a nice, a nice um, um, lesson that, uh, uh, a skill that I learned that was very simple. And sort of going off that similar theme for you, Shay, um, what types of foods uh, resonate or what styles of food resonate with the communities that you serve? And sort of thinking in terms of nourishing the body and the soul. Yeah, I mean, um, so again, using food as that tool to build community, we try and recognize 
different the places, the different places that people come from, and trying to reflect that into our food as well. And so we use uh, every opportunity to celebrate uh, different communities that are inside of our organization through food, um, whether that be through different kinds of holidays, you know, like Rosh Hashanah or the Lunar New Year, um, or um, through our community kitchens uh, geared towards different communities. So we've got a Sabor Latino, it's a, it's a, it's a Spanish-speaking kitchen, if you will. It recognizes the different diaspora of the Latin American culture through food. You know, you think, well, there's so many different types of food just within the Latin American diaspora. Uh, and so, um, yeah, and, and there's often times, you know, even in our, in our gardens, you know, people will come through and they'll be like, oh, you know, I miss this certain type of pepper or I miss this certain type of, you know, root vegetable that used to grow. We used to eat this in my country and I haven't been able to find it here. Um, our, our, our greenhouse workers will work with that individual to see if we can source, you know, a healthy, reliable source of seeds and we'll see if we could grow it, if we could propagate that into our, in, in our greenhouse and then transfer that into uh, the community garden when the weather starts to get nice and we start to, you know, um, move things outside and uh, oftentimes, you know, we're growing things that uh, we wouldn't have grown if not brought to our attention. So it's the amaranth, it's the kalulu, it's the different kinds of peppers that uh, people miss from, from the home country. Um, and so that's, those are the ways in which we kind of recognize um, the different types of pe uh, people inside of our, you know, the city of Toronto, uh, inside of our organization, uh, using food again as that place of connection. And then I guess sort of bringing this all together, we've got a question here that's asking, you know, what are the healthiest and best value foods to pack in my kids' school lunch and to make it harder? What if they don't eat meat? And what if they can't bring fish or nuts because of allergies? And this is, I think, the modern parents' <laughs> dilemma. I don't know who wants to take this, but maybe <laughs> I'm going to look at David first. <laughs> oh, wow. <clears throat> well, uh, if you look at um, my lunch that I bring to school, it's, I, it's, it's interesting as a chef, people will say, what are you eating? I've got to come over and see. And, it's okay, it's what we had last night. And I made a salad and I put everything on, the, on top of it. So a lot of times uh, um, I'll, I'll do a, a nice fresh green salad and then I'll have things like all of the vegetables that we had the night before um, on there too. And I think that if, um, if you have some fun with food, I remember um, uh, cooking for kids and, uh, or actually cooking for parents that had kids, I should say. And I remember um, uh, making some mashed potatoes and we had sweet potato in one, we had beets in another, we had roasted red pepper in another. And there was a, nutritious, uh, uh, a nutritionist and dietitian that were both working with me and they said, wow, you did this on purpose, you knew we were gonna be here. And I thought, no, I was just trying to make the food colorful. Um, and so by enhance uh, having uh, those mashed potatoes with different colors in it, uh, that kids were eating beets, uh, you know, eating different colors. So. I think having colorful foods, I think that's really key. Um, having some uh, cheeses in there. I am very accustomed to having no nuts as a, as a chef, you know, there's a restrictions. Uh, and uh, in, in food service business, I can't eat this. You know, there's, there's so many limitations when people come uh, to us. Um, and I always find it, uh, it, it, it's a great challenge. I, I, I had somebody come up to me and said, you're not gonna like me, I can't eat this, I can't eat this. I said, what a great challenge. Jeez, I've never had a chef say that to me, but it is. It's an opportunity for me to, to be resourceful and to look at those, um, those dishes. I think having some nice grilled, um, if, if again with kids, you might not get a positive on this, but grilled vegetables, grilled peppers that you can marinate in, in olive oil. Um, you know, I, I think grilling them and then cooking them longer so they're softer, I think that's a really good alternative. And making it flavorful. You know, nothing's worse than, here's a root vegetable, and yes, it tastes like a root vegetable. And my favorite one is when people say, I can't believe this is root vegetables, right? They, they taste good. So just finding ways to, to flavor a food. And I think the presentation is key too. I think even as kids, they'll look at it and, well, that looks, you know, that looks different. And I just wanna add one thing. Um, we're gonna talk about older kids now, because I worked in a nursing home and we had, when I first came into this nursing home, the chef who was training me said, we do these three period things for these three people. And they just took 
meat and pureed it and took the greens, pureed it. And it was like three ladles of different colored water. And I said, well, can't we thicken it up or something? No, don't worry, this is the way we do it. And it was like, I was bothered by that. And I remember when I took over when he left, which was one, uh, one week later, I, I got leaves of spinach and I made big, large quenelles of the pureed food and made them really nice and garnished it. And I remember bringing it out to the lady who was eating it. And I, she said, this isn't my plate. I can't eat those greens and I can't eat those garnishes. And I said, well, I looked out in the garden. I saw these beautiful flowers. I thought of you, I thought I would do this. And so let's just try it. If you don't like it, I'll go back to the way it was. Uh, and so I did that for the time, that, uh, a period of time. I remember one day we were short staffed. I couldn't do it, so it wasn't as nicely garnished. She sent it back to the kitchen. I'm not eating this. This isn't good. And, and this was just food that was pureed, that, in my opinion. That, uh, doesn't it. So I think our, uh, our respect for the visualization of it is really key. And then when you limit it uh, with what you can use, there's all kinds of different ways of making it taste good. Five minutes away from the end, and I'm going to be posing our last questions, starting with Shay, and then we'll run down the panel. So, um, given sort of your vast collective experience with and the expertise on how food nourishes us and more, what would you like the audience to take away from tonight? Um, well, I just think that uh, I think it's just what we've all been talking about here is that uh, recognizing that food is something that everybody here needs. There's none of us that can go without. And so uh, if just find that opportunity, you know, there was an earlier question about um, what to do if um, you don't have that person to eat with. And I think what we can all do is find that person that doesn't have a person, you know? Um, if there's anybody in your neighborhood or in your building or in your community that you feel and see is alone all the time, reach out. It's the onus could be on us to, to, to bring that person into our community. Rather than waiting for the invitation, be the one to start that conversation and to extend that hand. Um, because food, mental health, social connectedness, we all need somebody, so why not you? Why not you? Kian, same question to you. What would you like the audience to take away from tonight? Well, I would say that um, um, uh, sometimes we are being intimidated by what uh, a healthy diet should be. Uh, and just think about um, you know, the alternatives. Uh, we, we referred to the frozen fruits and vegetables, which are just as nutritious as the fresh ones. Um, you know, the um, uh, tinned sardines. I mean, uh, uh, here is a, a dense, uh, uh, a concentrated source of omega-3. Uh, you know, of course, the, you, have, you have the salmon, and, and, uh, but there are, you know, there are uh, alternatives. And um, uh, if, if you, there are allergies with respect, to whether it's nuts or, you know, um, plant-based uh, fatty acid that we find in the walnuts can be found elsewhere too, you know, in, 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 um, in uh, linseeds. And uh, so there, there are alternatives. And, and um, uh, uh, sometimes it's just a matter of, and especially, now you know there there are quite quite a few resources. I mean uh, that that we can turn to, but um, of course the dietitians are are really the experts uh, when it comes to you know uh, um, making recommendations. But um, uh, it, it's um, uh, I think it's it's a matter of be of, of being adventurous. Uh, with the food uh, and, uh, you know, just uh, have confidence that uh, things can be a little different too and, and that it will be fine, you know, that uh, you don't need uh, this revolution in your kitchen in order to have a, you know, a, a healthy diet. So um, basically a question of, uh, uh, of uh, self-confidence and, and, uh, and also, um, you know, uh, challenging oneself uh, to, to go beyond our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And then same question to you, David. What is the one thing that you'd like the audience to take away tonight? Well, limited to one thing. Um, that's hard for me as a teacher. I, um, I think uh, <clears throat> um, keeping it simple. I think having, uh, we, I always say having a good French knife, salt and pepper at home, 
uh, and developing a passion for it. So uh, for instance, uh, it's not that difficult. Uh, you have a little bit of confidence, and at first you might not, but let's just try it um, and, and see if it works, and you put something together. And as I've said to many young people who are uh, um, in my kitchens uh, over the time, you know, okay, so we try something and it didn't work. We have to get rid of the evidence. Go get two forks and let's get rid of it, <laughs> you know? And so, I mean, that's the worst case. Unless, of course, it's really, really overdone. Uh, that's what your sisters are for, right? So anyway, I think uh, the key is uh, have fun, uh, develop passion uh, for the food and the respect for it. And I think, um, and get rid of the evidence, right? Thank you. Well, on behalf of the Ontario Brain Institute, I'd like to thank each of our panelists for sharing their expertise with us. We'd also like to thank you, the audience, for engaging with this talk tonight. There were a lot of questions and we couldn't get through them all, but I'm hopeful that you all stay with us for the next part where you can ask your questions to each of the panelists. Uh, we also have some resources to share with you for more information about this topic. We'll be posting them on the screen shortly. And a complete list will also be available on the Ontario Brain Institute's website. So that's braininstitute.ca. Under resources, you'll click on the OBI public talks and that will bring you to the public talks page where you can find more resources. Uh, your feedback is also very valuable to us. Tell us about what you enjoyed, what you would have liked to see more of. And you have a survey link in the chat box if you're online or you can use a printed copy or you can scan the QR code that was there a minute ago. So yeah, please do share your thoughts with us about tonight's talk. And yeah, the Ontario Brain Institute's public talks are designed to share the latest knowledge on brain health and to offer simple tips to manage both health and wellness. The next talk will be the first in the series called Supporting Brain Health Across the Lifespan, and that will be taking place in June 2024. So we hope to see you there. And finally, I'd like to invite everyone who's gathered here in person to join us for a reception in the mezzanine or the bistro. And to all of our audience members, thank you so much and have a good night.